Hello, and welcome to this podcast of Sunday Sermons from Concord United Methodist Church. We hope that you'll find this message to be meaningful, insightful, and a refreshing part of your daily walk with God. Please feel free to share this podcast with family, friends, or anyone else who might benefit from it. This podcast is part of the digital ministries of Concord United, and we are grateful that you have chosen to experience worship and God's Word with us. For more information about Concord United and its ministries, please visit our website at concordunited.org. It's what he said. Don't look at me. That's what Jesus said. But we're going to deal with it because it's actually good news, and we're going to get to it. Um, there's, an underlying, there's an underlying factor to all of this that uh, I'm going to tell you a quick story uh, and, and that I hope illustrates the point of how important it is for us uh, to make this the, the grounding, I guess, the grounding layer, the grounding dimension of our life. Uh, been, I have a granddaughter, two granddaughters. The older one now is eight. She is involved in karate, and, and she's this petite little thing that puts on those gloves and pads on her feet and becomes this lean, mean fighting machine. She's, she's just uh, really incredible. We went to a graduation the other day where they, she'd gotten a new belt, and they were breaking stuff. And, and it reminded me of, I, I did karate back when I was a young, before we had children and had a little bit more time. I was worked with a, and I've probably talked about him before, ta- I worked with a guy who was a, a fourth degree black belt, and I'd always want to take karate. Karate. So he gave me lessons out behind the radio station, literally, and uh, we would fight. People would blow their horns. We'd be back there fighting, and, uh, and people thought, you know, okay, it's disc jockeys. They're probably drunk and fighting, and, and we actually were, were practicing, and we weren't uh, intoxicated. But at any rate, at one point along the way in the training, we broke things. And the reason you do, it's not to show off, well, maybe a little, but it's really not to show off. The whole point of it is most of the time uh, you're doing katas or forms. As some, depending on which system of karate you're doing, and you're, you're punching the air, and you learn technique, and it's all really important, but you don't really understand how much power you're developing. So when you break something, you, under, you begin to understand this, this really works. So we'd broken boards and, and that sort of thing, and one night we came into the, to his dojo, as they say, the, the place where the lessons are taught, and he had two-inch masonry blocks, and he said, all right, for anybody who wants to, we're going to break a block. And I thought, okay, I can do this. So we put the blocks down and, and, and got into the proper stance, and I yelled a fierce ki-eye. That's the, that's the loud yell that people who practice karate make right before they punch or hit something. And I, I got, you know, I, I, had my, I had my stance right. It was down. We had the thing low to the ground, down on my knees. And I came down with a mighty ki-eye, and my hand bounced off of that uh, masonry block. And you can, there's a little knot right here, and you can still feel it. I do. I just knew I'd broken my hand. And people were trying not to laugh because I just turned beet red. And you know how it is when you really would like to cry, but you wouldn't dare because you're around these other people. So I sucked it up. And my friend who taught me, he said, you know, you had everything right, except you didn't commit. You didn't commit to it. You thought that you could not break that block, and you were right because that's what you thought. But what if you tried it again and thought that you could break the block? What if you committed fully to it? Don't aim for the top of the block. Tame, aim for the bottom of the block and commit to it with everything you have, and I promise you it will break. So with my hand throbbing, I said, okay, I'm going to give it another try to try to save face. And so I got down, same stance, and I did, and I paused, and I took a deep breath, and I aimed for the bottom of that block, and I thought, you know, this is going to hurt either way. So I may as well see if I can break the block. So I came down with all my might, the fiercest key eye I ever uttered, and lo and behold, that two-inch masonry block broke right in half, and it didn't hurt. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, it's about commitment. You have to commit to every move. And I thought, you know what, that'll, that'll, that'll take you a long way in life. And I've thought about what he said many times and I thought about it because we were just recently watching a video of Anne Lynn doing karate and breaking things. And it, and it reminded me of that. And it, and I, and it all came to mind <clears throat> when I was thinking about this passage because it's, a, it's got some scary words in it. But... The wellspring, if you will, of, of, this, 
of this passage, I believe, is the idea of commitment. And it's something that people struggle with, it seems, and people have always struggled with it. But it's why relationships don't work out. It's why jobs don't last. It, it's why athletes fail. You know, athletes call it follow-through. Uh, and in golf, if you're a batter, if you're a quarterback, I remember Peyton Manning saying one time, the reason people miss so many short passes is because they're trying to guide the ball into the receiver's hand instead of following through with their form like you're supposed to. And no matter how long or short the pass is, you have to follow through. In other words, you have to fully commit to that motion, and we have to fully commit. And so, as we think about crazy stuff, Jesus said, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to deal with a very difficult passage. I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to talk about it for a few minutes, because as I said, this is really good news for us, and it will come to bear in a couple of important dimensions of our life. So, let me read this. This is from Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace." In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. We better pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We do for this passage. Uh, as we thank you for the ones where we read about Jesus loving us as shepherds tenderly love their sheep. We, we, we love this passage too because we know it's from you, directed for us. And so now we ask that the same spirit that inspired Luke to write would inspire us to hear. And we would boldly listen and we would boldly allow your word to infiltrate our hearts and become truth for our lives on this very day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, okay, what on earth do we do with this? From, from the same man, from the same man he brought us, love your enemies, today we get hate your family. And, and, and oh, let's throw in, if you want to be my disciples, you have to give up everything you have. No, no worries, right? Jesus, that's no big deal. Just come on and follow. We just have a couple of little things we need from you. Well, uh, yeah, it is a big deal. And at face value, who would follow Jesus? Who could follow Jesus? Who could follow through with this? But we have to know that Jesus always wants what's best for us, and that's what he's angling for here. If we can hear him the way he was heard 2,000 years ago and appro appropriate these words uh, in a way that can be truth and life for us. Um, there are a couple of three different ways to approach this. And in 29 years of attempting to preach, I've preached this passage a couple of times and probably come at it from both directions. And you know, the preaching professors will tell you, find one path and follow that. Don't ever try to do two or three. Well, I looked around. We don't have any preaching professors here today, as far as I know. So I'm going to go. I think there are two paths we can follow today that are both really important. So let me ask you this question. Um, are you interested perhaps in strengthening, having stronger relationships with family and friends? Is that something that interests you? Or let me ask you this, are you interested in, in being a more devoted, a more consistent follower of Jesus Christ, really working on that part of your life. If you're interested in those things, then, then we're going we're gonna to be fine this morning because these, these are the two pathways, relationship and discipleship. Both come to bear. Both 
Both of those, both of those are best whenever they come from a place of commitment. In fact, I would submit that that's the only way they work. So with commitment as the, as the wellspring of everything, let's talk about relationship and discipleship for a minute and see if we can make sense and appropriate these words of Jesus. And I think we can. Let's, let's dive right in to the deep end. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother... Brother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even their own life, that person cannot be my disciples. Now, Jesus had just been talking uh, with his disciples and some others, kind of an inner circle group, at the home of a Pharisee. And he had given some, some kingdom wisdom to them. And, and the people are traveling with him. And it's important to remember, the large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Hang on to that because that's huge. They were traveling with Jesus. Where were they going? They weren't going to the beach. They weren't going to the mountains. Well, they were going to one small hill outside of Jerusalem, but they didn't know anything about that yet. But Jesus was on the way. This is where the Luke talks about Jesus being on the journey. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and not, yeah, there would be initially a parade where they would shout, Hosanna, and, and lay palm branches down, and by the end of the week, they would be shouting for his very death. So that's where he was headed. And, and that was all, I'm sure, running in background as he looked at these people. And, and I just have this feeling that as they were traveling, Jesus stopped and looked back at them. And he thought, you know what? They have no idea what they're getting into. Because let's face it, following Jesus at that point was kind of a hoot. I mean, you know, dinner and a show. He was, he was creating these, these banquets out of five loaves of five little fish and two loaves of bread. We've talked about that. And, and all these wonderful feasts. And then he would also have the, the miraculous healings and his wonderful spellbinding teaching. I mean, who wouldn't follow Jesus? But they just didn't understand where that was going to end up. And I think Jesus felt like it was time to start, to start helping them to understand. And so, so he looks back at all those people following him and he said, okay, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Unless you're willing to hate your mother and father and so on, you can't follow me. Now, Flash back to a few weeks ago, and I dropped a seminary phrase on you, uh, and, and I'm going to drop it again today because uh, it's, it's super important, and that is the phrase, some of you may remember, a couple of you emailed me and said you, you love learning this new phrase, Semitic hyperbole. And then Semitic, just, it's just a language that Semites spoke. Uh, all Jews were Semites. Not all Semites were Jews. Semites could also have been Arab, but it was, it was a Semitic language, and so part of that language and that culture was to exaggerate to make a point. And so Semitic hyperbole, that's all that is. It's an exaggeration. And so if you take all that, and I don't know, Jack Wilson could probably break this down into great detail for us. Uh, but I'm going, and, and I'm, I went that way because he's sitting up there singing in a choir. But I'm going to, to kind of dumb it down a little bit because that's the way I have to receive it. It's, it, it what this probably means is you need to love me more you need to love me first. And if you love me more and love me first, then all the other relationships of your life will fall uh, better into place and you'll be more equipped to, to love everyone else. Jesus, when Jesus is our lead relationship, then we are, are able then to lead other relationships that will impact others in a very positive way. Or put more succinctly, when Jesus comes first, others come next. Our human nature is to put us first. Or maybe we're willing to say Jesus first, but hey, I need to be up there near the, near the head of the line. And, and that's not a criticism. I hope not because I'm, I'm guilty as charged, but it's human nature. But king, the kingdom uh, went against human nature, and Jesus was trying to, ha to, for, to help us adopt a kingdom nature. And so the point is, if we love Jesus first, then all the other relationships will fall into place. And when you think about that, it makes perfect sense. Um, what are some things that will, that will torpedo a relationship? Hateful speech will certainly do it. And you know, it's so funny. There was an old, old love song that says, you always uh, hurt the ones you love. 
Uh, and, and it's true. We talk, sometimes we talk to the people in our lives that we're closest to, uh, maybe, maybe spouse, it may be family members or close friends. Sometimes we talk to them in a way we would never talk to a stranger. And we take liberties and we say hurtful things. And we have to, when, whenever that happens, we have to remember that if we're going to put Jesus first, then we have to do it his way. And what did he say? He said, I tell you, uh, it's not enough to just not murder. Yeah, thou shalt not murder. But he says, anybody who insults a brother or a sister, anybody who speaks harshly, anybody who speaks in anger, they're on their way to committing murder. So if, if we were to put that first, if we really took that seriously and put Jesus first in the relationship, then whenever things are not going exactly as we wanted and we have an opportunity to speak our mind to someone who's near and dear to us, someone we're in a relationship with, maybe we would approach it differently. Maybe we wouldn't be as controlling. That's another thing uh, that's, that's very difficult in relationships uh, is when somebody wants to, to control everything and, and, and want to have everything their way. But Jesus was always the first will be last. The last will be first. And so if we put Jesus first, then all of a sudden we can't do it that way anymore with integrity. And we could go on and go on through things that are hard on relationships. We we want to put Jesus first, and when we do that, then others will come next. Now, just a point of clarification. That does not set us up to be abused by anyone in a relationship. Jesus is not calling for that. We should never allow ourselves to be physically or verbally abused ever, not one time in any relationship. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is being willing to step back and let Jesus control our ego a little bit, and just maybe whenever we're in the midst of conflict, we'll hear him saying, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers can also be translated reconcilers. Reconcilers are the ones that go first. They're the ones that go, you know what? I was wrong. I, I was wrong. And that can then be the beginning of a healing relationship. And so when we have dysfunction in our families and we have these relationship issues, I believe that we are called to put Jesus first and then let the relationship flow out of that. Again, I'm not saying we need to put ourselves in harm's way. I'm not saying we have to give in to everyone else. If you feel like you're right about something, stand on that and claim it. But we can do it. By the way, this works in relationships with people of other political parties uh, or, or other different uh, you know, points of perspective. We can stand our ground and state our case without berating and insulting and yelling and hurting people. And if we put Jesus first, that becomes a lot easier. Someone has to break the destructive patterns in relationships. And Jesus would love for that to be you or me. Relationship. Commit, we commit to Jesus fully, putting him first. And when we put Jesus first, others come next. So, now, on to discipleship, and I'm going to pluck a couple of verses out of here just to make the point again when we talk about discipleship. Yes, whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be their disciple. Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. And I'm going to say something that may sound, may, I don't want you to take it the wrong way, but I feel like this is, this is really important. This was something that it took me a while to learn, and it helps mo focus this thing down about carrying your cross. I'm, an, I'm a 68-year-old guy, soon to be 69. I love the Allman Brothers. I learned how to play the guitar listening to the Allman Brothers and Dwayne Allman's guitar, great guitar. His brother Greg was the singer in that band. Uh, his brother Greg lived, outlived uh, him, him by a long time, and, and he's dead now. But he has a book, and I'm not necessarily recommending you read it because it's, it's, it is one of the most profanity-laden things I've ever read uh, because it's just first person out of Greg Allman's mouth. But the name of the book is My Cross to Bear. 
And his point in it is that, you know, yes, every problem that I've had in my life is mine. You know, drugs and alcohol. He, whenever his brother died tragically in a car wreck, wreck years, or a motorcycle wreck years before Greg did, uh, they, were, um, they were not speaking to each other over, over a drug issue. And so, you know, he, he says, that's my cross to bear, all these things that I've gone through. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not the cross he's talking about. Now, I'm looking at many of you, and I know some of the struggles you have. I know about my own struggles, and they're real, and Jesus cares deeply about them. I promise you that. But that's that's not exactly what he's talking about here. When he's talking about bearing a cross, he's talking about living sacrificially for others, and that's what disciples do by putting other people first, starting with Jesus, then we begin to live out of this place of discipleship. That's what he actually means by carrying a cross. That's why it was so poignant that he said this as they were on the way, literally. They were on the way. Now, it was coming, you know, who knows, weeks or months after that, but he was headed for the cross. But this This is how important this is. He said, discipleship has to be a commitment to me, and you have to be willing to commit your entire life to it. But that's not bad news. That's good news. In fact, he he said, count the cost. And, you know, and he gives these two examples of uh, someone who's going to build a tower or, or a king going to war. But I thought about it differently. When I was in the radio business, every, and we've done this here, Will and I have done this with staff, we, we call it zero-based marketing, where we would go in once a year and it's like every record we play, every promotion we do, every jingle we have, every single thing that goes over the air, we ask, why? What is our target audience? How are we trying to reach them? And does this record or that jingle or this promotion, whatever, this disc jockey, whoever it is, is all of this contributing to our path toward that goal? And if it isn't, then we either adjust it or we move on. Things change. And we do that at the church. We do that here. You know, we're here to share Christ, serve others, and grow in faith. And periodically, we talk about the things that we do. Are all of these things that we do, are they contributing to that? And if they don't, then we have to find a way to adjust or perhaps um, take a ministry and, 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 let that, and let that finish its season and move on to a new one because we have to stay focused. And you do it in your own life. You do it with a budget, I'll bet you. You know, you look at back periodically, what are we spending on? Well, why are we spending money on this? And we, we don't use it anymore. When Lynn and I moved to our new house just a while back, we looked at our cable bill and it was ridiculous what we were paying for cable TV. And what made it worse was it, we figured we were watching less than 5% of everything that was shown on that cable channel, uh, on, on our cable. 5%. And we're paying a fortune for it. So we stepped back and said, what do we really watch? And we decided we moved to the new house. You know, we're going to cut the cable. So we have, we have internet, but we have, I think it's YouTube TV. And I'm not advertising for them. Hulu does it. Lots of places can do that. And you can get the local channels. And you can get a few channels, ESPN. Got to have ESPN. Fall's coming. Got to watch some football. But, but we, it's a fraction of what we were spending before. We counted the cost. And I think what Jesus is also saying, when you count the cost, it just might be. That if, if we were to sit down with our lives and do that, what, do we ha- what are our priorities? Where are we spending most of our time? It just might be that we would find something that's taking a big chunk of time and we would say, hmm, not sure that's contributing that much. And we might just eliminate that or, or, or reposition it, retool it, reconfigure it. I don't know. But this, is, this discipleship business this, this requires everything. And so we have to go back and look at what, what gets more time than that. And if we put it first, though, it's just like with relationships, then everything else falls into place. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I'm taking voice lessons. 
after 68 years, and I've been singing since I was four years old, not very well a lot of the time, but I sang. I've always sung, um, and I've always sung wrong. I'm finding out. You know, I sang rock and roll, and the last thing you think about is technique. You just get up there, I got to get the words right, I got to try to get the melody right, and that's the way I sang. And I don't know if you know, we all know how great a singer Haley is, but Haley also not only has a beautiful gift, but she is highly educated, and she, I'm taking, as many people are, I'm taking voice lessons from Haley. And, and, and let me tell you about my very first lesson. You know, I go in thinking I'm going to learn phrasing and I'm going to learn how to, how, to, how to get my pitch better and all this. So you know what the first thing we did? Are you ready? Very first thing we did, first lesson. And I'm like, what? How, wait, you went to where? You, this is what they teach you at school? And she's like, trust me. And then up a half step and all. And I came to realize it's brilliant because here's what she explained to me. The, all the sound we have, everything that we do, we, when we talk, we scream, we sing, whatever it is we're doing, it's just air moving through our vocal cords. It's nothing else. It's air making our vocal cords vibrate. And so the way you produce that air and the way you direct that air through them and then the way you use your throat to make as much space as you can so it will resonate more is going to, that's your sound, that's what you sound like. And then you figure out the pitch and then you work on phrasing and all that sort of thing. But that core sound has to be good. And if it's not, nothing else will be good. You can't, all the phrasing and all the intonation in the world isn't going to help if, it, if that initial sound isn't good. And while I'll never be able to be the kind of singer Haley is because she has a gift for it, I can be a better singer. And, and anybody can learn to be a better singer just by doing that. And that is absolutely fundamental. It's the wind blowing through your vocal cords that produce the sound. And I would submit to you that if we want to be disciples of Jesus Christ, it's as complicated and yet as simple as allowing the wind of the Holy Spirit to blow through our life and let that be the fundamental dimension of who we are. It's Jesus Christ living in us by the power of the Holy Spirit moving through our life and creating this music, this song. And then everything else we do, whether we're working or in school or giving struggling preachers vocal lessons or whatever it is we're doing in our life, cooking dinner, going to the beach, whatever we do, we'll do it better, we'll do it more authentically because that is then at the very basis. And we will find ways to live out our discipleship then at the beach and at Walmart and at school and at work or wherever we are because we got the Spirit singing through us. And that's fundamental. And that's discipleship. Discipleship is not an add-on. It's, it's not a little box on our calendar. It's not something we do on Thursday at 2 or Monday at 4. Discipleship is fundamental. It's everything. Discipleship is a life path that leads to deep fulfillment. And remember, Jesus said he wants us to have abundant life. But we, can't, we won't have that abundant life by being a disciple on Tuesday at 10 a.m. and Wednesday at 6, which I've tried it that way too and still struggle trying to be consistent at it. But we can point that way and we can try and let that then be the fundamental to who we are. Let that commitment to Jesus then inform and fuel everything else we do. And guess what? You'll be blessed and everyone around you will be blessed. And you know what? You'll be able to love mother, father, wife, children, sister, brother, husband, whoever, you'll be able to love them in a way you've never loved them before because it will be the love of Jesus loving through you and transforming moments. Amen? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we, we thank you for loving us enough to tell us the hard stuff and, and helping us, oh God, by the very power of your Spirit to then live it out.
So, so that's what we aim to do, Lord. Uh, we pray for the power of your Spirit to go with us and to help us to always put Jesus first in our relationship and as we seek discipleship to make not only room for him, but to put him first and let him help us decide what else we have room for. And we will then find fulfillment and joy in following. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Concord United Methodist Church. This podcast is a ministry of Concord United, and we would love to hear from you. To contact us, please send an email to podcasts at concordunited.org with sermons in the subject line. For more information about Concord United, including worship times, service opportunities, mission efforts, and classes, please visit our website at concordunited.org. We also invite you to download and enjoy our daily devotional podcasts presented by the pastors and members of Concord United. Finally, we would appreciate it if you would leave a rating and a review of this podcast so that others can discover it and benefit from it.